And then in the second part of the session, Anoop is gonna show you a demo of traceable of the product. Um, so basically the agenda for today is to cover a few different areas. The first one is to talk about uh, traditional application security uh, versus modern application security. Because many things change in the field of application security in the la last 10 years. And I'm gonna cover the reasons why application security today looks very different than application security 10 years ago. Uh, we're gonna talk about the access control challenge or the authorization challenge, which is probably the biggest challenge in API security today. And then we, we will cover some of the OSP top 10 for APIs. And uh, we're gonna see a few examples for uh, real world <coughs> scenarios. So just a few words about myself. I'm the head of security research at Traceable AI. Um, I got eight years of experience with application security and I grew up with APIs. So what does it mean that I grew up with APIs? Basically, I started my career back in Israel about uh, nine years ago. And I used to be part of the red team of the Israeli army. And as you can imagine, I, I used to work with many government, military and financial organizations. And as you could imagine, those organizations have more legacy technologies. I used to see a lot of Java, ASP.NET and SAP. And all of these uh, applications uh, are based on very traditional concepts, like multi-page applications, on-prem environments, a waterfall deployment. And APIs used to be just like a niche component, mostly for B2B communication, you know, SOAP APIs, but it wasn't like the main, the main uh, component of the application. After serving for five years in the Israeli army, I decided to buy a one-way ticket and to move to the Bay Area in California. And in the last four years, I've been working mostly with the startups and T1 companies in the US. And I got exposed to a new field of technologies like Ruby on Rails, Node.js, Elixir, and a lot of modern concepts like single page applications, cloud environments, CI CD. And the most important part, all these new technologies are heavily based on APIs. APIs are not just a niche component. This is the backbone of the application. And the, the next thing that I realized after I moved here is that I couldn't really find the same vulnerabilities that I used to find back in Israel. Because if we talk about uh, traditional technologies, they have one type of vulnerabilities. But when it comes to APIs, I had to adapt my mindset in order to stay relevant in the field and to be able to find vulnerabilities and to exploit APIs. So let's let's talk about what changed uh, in before we even talk about uh, application security. I want to talk about what changed in applications in general in the last uh, five or ten years. So if we take a look at the top part of the screen, you can see how the pattern of traffic would look like between the client, server, and database. Let's let's take a look. So the client would ask for a specific. Uh, uh, basically for a specific page. In this case, you can see that the client would ask, this is the browser, would ask for the homepage.jsp. Then the web server would process the request and fetch data from the database in order to, uh, to render a visual page. And this visual page, which is the HTML page, which is JavaScript, would be sent back to the client. Uh, and then the client, the client didn't have too much processing power. The client used to be pretty simple. The client would just uh, present the HTML page from the server to the user. So this is how it used to look uh, in more traditional applications. When we talk about modern applications today, the pattern looks very differently. Let's review it. So first of all, clients know much better what they want. Instead of asking for a whole web page, they would ask for specific pieces of information. For example, uh, get the last 10 notification from the API, or they would ask for the, for the top 10 users from the API. Uh, they would send specific filters because they know much better what they want. Uh, and then the web server, which in this case, it's an API, would fetch this data from the databases and it, as you can see, there are more types of databases today. On top of like the traditional SQL, you can find Elastic and NoSQL. Uh, and the web server would send it back, this data from the database, it would send it back to the client in the format of raw JSON objects. So in some ways, I would say that today, APIs are used in some way as a proxy between the client 
in the database because they just transfer the data. They don't really generate any HTML page or something like that. And one of the most important changes when it comes to application security is that the rendering uh, component, the rendering component is a component that is responsible to create those visual pages. So in traditional applications, it used to be on the backend. The backend would render the HTML page. But today, this process of getting the raw data and making it uh, more like a visual page is done on the client side. So the client would just get JSONs from the API and present it to the, to the client, to the user. So a few other changes uh, is that today you can find more types of clients. On top of the traditional browser, you can find IoT devices, you can find uh, mobile devices that use the API, and even other developers that use your APIs to build their own applications. And another very interesting point, this is something that I used to hear a lot, that APIs have less abstraction yields. It took me some time to understand what it means. But basically, I would say the biggest difference today is that today there is a shared language between the client, the API, and sometimes even database. All of them speak the same uh, language of JSON. JSON is the new Esperanto for, for uh, web applications. So the same, the same uh, let's say that you're using, like for example, Uber, the same uh, JSON object that is processed by your client application might be the same object that is stored in database and the same object is understood by the web server. Uh, there is much less parsing and processing of this information, which makes it very convenient for the, for the developers. But at the same time, if you take a look at the traffic from the client to the API, it would be much easier for you as an attacker to understand the business logic and the underlying implementation of the application just because they speak the same language. I want to also to say a few words about uh, DevOps. So there is good news and bad news. Let's start with the good news. <clears throat> First of all, classic IT issues like open ports, old versions, barely exist today. Just because the cloud providers like AWS or GCP take care of these issues today, it's really hard to like, uh, for example, to leave like, uh, like you know, port twenty two of SSH open to the internet. <clears throat> and the bad news is that I would say that in some way, um, doing DevOps became too easy. It's just a few clicks on the AWS console and you spin up a new API. Just a few clicks and you spin up a new environment. So because it's too easy to do DevOps and to like spin up new instances and environments, uh, it makes it much more challenging to keep on track with this, uh, like with this whole APIs and all of your microservices, uh, which leads to shadow APIs, which are APIs that nobody knows uh, uh, why they're there. So let's talk about, in, in terms of application security, uh, let's talk about the good news. Many of the more traditional application security vulnerabilities that we used to see a lot in traditional applications really exist today. If you talk about SQL injection, for example, um, it's not very easy to find SQL injections today in modern applications just because developers use ORM environments today instead of native SQL. And I'll tell you a secret. The reason why developers choose to use ORM, usually it's not because of security, just because it's more easy to use them. So, but if you use ORM, uh, in most cases, you're protected from SQL injection. Uh, if we talk about CSRF, uh, today developers use the authorization header instead of cookies. And if you don't use cookies for authentication mechanism, the API is protected from uh, CSRF. If you talk, for example, about XXE, which is a vulnerability in the parsing process of XML, uh, today it barely exists just because developers use uh, JSONs instead of XMLs. But with the uh, good news comes also the bad news. So APIs, <clears throat> it's not a secret that APIs became like a very attractive target for attackers. Uh, today, many of the modern uh, ap like modern of many of the modern exploits you can see in large companies like Facebook, Uber, Shopify, uh, they happen in the API because APIs actually increase the attack surface. APIs make it easier for attackers to exploit. Uh, I feel like the main three points why APIs are more dangerous, the, the first one is that the attack surface is much larger. 
APIs expose more endpoints in more parameters uh, where attackers can send input. And if you ask any pen tester or any hacker, they would tell you that the more parameters you can send to the application, basically the more attack surface you have, because every parameter is a new place to inject something or to manipulate the input in order to get something that you are supposed to get. And the second point is APIs are oversharing, and because they have less abstraction layers, it's much easier to understand the business logic. And APIs are also predictable. The REST standard encourages developers to, to develop APIs in a very predictable way which makes it uh, easier for developers to use them, but at the same time, it makes, uh, it makes it easier for attackers to exploit them. So after seeing all these changes, all this new trend in APIs and application security, uh, I joined OWASP and Erase alone, and we built the OWASP top 10 for APIs, which is a new list, the same thing as the OWASP top 10, just like top 10 for APIs, to define this new list of API threats uh, that are more relevant today for APIs. So I'm going to show you a few examples of uh, uh, of some of the items from the list. But before that, I want to talk about the biggest challenge of APIs today, uh, which is the authorization challenge. Most of the uh, exploits, most of the like the critical exploits you can find today on APIs, are in some way related to authorization. Uh, this is probably the biggest challenge today, and it took me time to understand why. Why it's so hard to implement a decent authorization mechanism. I believe there are two main reasons. The first one is that uh, if you think about it, authorization, it's not something that exists in one place in the application. If you compare it, for example, to the authentication mechanism, authentication is usually done in one place in the code or maybe a few places in the code, but it's not something very spread out. You can like actually uh, put the boundaries and to say, okay, this is where the, the authentication happens. But when it comes to authorization, Authorization actually exists in almost every line of code, almost, I'm sorry, almost every like uh, function in the code. So if we talk about function of authorization, it can be done in the configuration, in the API gateway, or in the code itself. We talk about object level authorization. Uh, it's done in almost every controller that receives input from the user. So it's a very spread out mechanism. Many developers need to follow uh, the security best practices in order to make the authorization mechanism uh, good. And the second point is that today, APIs and modern applications usually uh, have very complex structures of users and roles. So for example, in this ride sharing app, you can find riders, drivers, and admins. And then you can find like weird scenarios. For example, that a rider has two, two sub users or that one user belongs to two different groups, which makes it more challenging to create these policies. Let's talk about the biggest uh, API vulnerability, the most common one, broken object level authorization. You, you might know this one as IDOR, Insecure Direct Object Reference. It's the same thing, but we decided to change the name from diff uh, different reasons. And what happens in this type of vulnerability is basically, let's say, for example, that you took a ride on some uh, ride sharing app. And after you took the ride, you want to, to give good rating to the rider, to the driver, sorry. Uh, so what you do is to, is to click the five stars. And then behind the scenes, your client would send an API call to API slash trips slash rate trip. Um, but the problem is that you, as a user on this app, you took many rides uh, in the past. So your mobile client has to mention which trip you want to update and to give it uh, five stars. So this is where the ID of the trip comes into the picture. You can see here it's like 718492. Uh, so this is how your uh, client communicates to the API which object you want to update. And then what happens in many cases, the developers that write the API, they don't actually validate that this ID belongs to you, to the login user. And they just take the ID as is and update it on the database or do some, some, some manipulation on this object based on the ID sent from the client. So if you're, legit, if you, if you're like a legit user and you don't have any malicious intentions, it's fine. But what happens when attackers Attackers can easily change the trip ID to a trip ID of someone else. And basically in this use case, 
I could write a script to change all the trips to rating of zero, for example, because the developers don't validate that the ID belongs to me, so I can update any idea that I want. Uh, it's a very common vulnerability, and I want to show an example uh, how it's exploited in the wild. So this is on Uber. This is a full account takeover. This is this is showing how Bola broken object level authorization can lead to full account takeover. Basically, the security researcher uh, Anand Prakash from AppSecure found an API endpoint on Uber of get consent screen details. That what happens in this API call, you send your user ID and you get in the response details about this user. Um, and then Anand tried to, to change uh, the user ID from his own user ID to user ID of someone else. And he found that he can get details of a different user, both riders and drivers. So basically by changing the, it's a very simple attack. You just change the ID from your own ID to an ID of another user and you get uh, uh, many details about the other users, including PII, uh, first name and last name and phone number. But more important than that, this API endpoint also returned the authentication token of the user. So it, uh, Anand was able to, to take the authentication token of the other user from the response and log in on behalf of the user. So this is how he found this full account takeover. Let's jump to number three, uh, excessive data exposure. This is one of my favorite vulnerabilities because in order to exploit it, you don't need to work very hard as a pen tester. So instead of like finding like complex uh, scenarios and like chain different vulnerabilities, you just take a look at the API response and you can see that the API leak PII by design, PII of other users. So let's see how this, this scenario would look like, how this vulnerability looks like behind the scenes. It's very common to find it on dating gaps for some reason. So I gave you here this uh, dating app and you you basically use this app and you swipe uh, right and left and then you see the profile of Bob. Uh, on, the, on the screen itself of the mobile application, you can see only the profile picture and the name and the hobbies of Bob. All of them are public information and nothing sensitive. But what happens is if you take a look at the traffic between the client and the API, you can see the API call to get slash users slash 717, which is the ID of Bob. And the response, uh, you can see all the public information. You can see that the response contains a JSON with the name, the hobbies, the profile picture, but also it contains the address of Bob, which is a very sensitive information that shouldn't be exposed to other users. So what happens, the developers on the backend, they rely on the developers on the front end to filter out this data so the client can actually see it. And they actually did it. You can see the, the data on the view, but uh, filtering this uh, information on the client side is a very bad idea because maybe a regular user wouldn't be able to see it, but a very uh, like attacker, a very basic attacker can just sniff the traffic and see this information of other users. And this is a very common vulnerability. Um, one example, it's from the three fun app. It's basically uh, for couples that are looking to spice up the relationship. Uh, it was found by Alex Thomas for, from Pentest Partners. He was looking to find vulnerabilities in this three fun app. Uh, and what he found is ba basically some type of a dating app for couples that are looking to, uh, to add other people to the relationship. And what you can see here on the, uh, what Alex found is that there is an API called to match users. This is an API endpoint and it returns the users around you. Um, so the app can start showing you users and like to swipe uh, right and left. Uh, but on top of the, of the public information, this endpoint returned, the API also returned the specific location of the user and even private photos that the users didn't want to share with everyone. So this is just like from looking at the traffic, Alex was able to find uh, this vulnerability. The next thing that he did uh, was very interesting to see. He mapped all the users around the White House uh, that used the app. So this is a very interesting use case. Uh, cool, let's, let's jump into A5, broken function level authorization. This is a different type of uh, access control problem in APIs. And it happens when the API, one API exposes a few different sub APIs, which one of them, that they should be accessed by different types of users. 
So you have the drivers API that should be accessed only by drivers. You have the writers and the admin APIs that should be accessed only by admins. And then the admin API exposes different endpoints with admin functions. So you have this admin, this is a legit admin. It wants to delete a specific user. Let's say that the user violated some of the application uh, uh, policies, and then the admin wants to delete this user. So if the admin send this API call to the admin API of delete slash users slash 717, this is a legit API call because he's an admin. He's supposed to be able to do it. But what would happen if an attacker that doesn't have admin privileges would send the same exact API call? Let's say this is an attacker that has like a, a simple account of a writer, uh, but he, he would just use the credentials of a simple writer to delete a user. So what happens in many cases is that the developers on the backend, they don't validate that the user belongs to the admin group, and they would provide him access uh, to the admin function of deleting users. In this case, the attacker can easily delete all the users on the API. So this is, uh, this is Buffla. Uh, a recent example from Shopify, uh, it was a bounty of 20K from HackerOne. It was found by UZ Sunny. Uh, this vulnerability on Shopify allowed the attacker to assign himself as a collaborator. Basically, there was an admin function that allows you to, to add a new collaborator to the shop. And a collaborator is some type of an admin, so you could, as a simple user to call this API endpoint and add yourself as a collaborator on, Shopif on the Shopify shop and to give you full access to change products and so on. Um, so this is one example for, uh, <laughs> for broken function of authorization. So let's jump to mass assignment. This is one of the coolest uh, API vulnerabilities. Uh, it's not only in APIs, but in APIs, it becomes much more common. So in order to explain what is mass assignment, I want to show you what is not mass assignment. So on the left side here, you can see how a simple code to add a user to a system would look on traditional application. It doesn't use mass assignment. Basically, the developer would take each one of the uh, query parameters, it comes from the client and assign it to a new variable and then save this, this, uh, this new object to the database, basically a new user. Uh, but the, the developer uh, picks specifically the, the variables he wants to assign to this new object of the user, which is the first name, the past name, and the uh, last name, and the password. Uh, so this, this code is not vulnerable to one assignment. This is safe. But what happens today in modern applications, it's very common to see developers use, use this uh, mass assignment trick that saves them um, out of time. So instead of like writing those, uh, those uh, many lines of code, they can, just run, they, they can just write one line of code. And to take the object from the user, basically the client would send a JSON with all the parameters, and they wouldn't validate which, uh, which parameters should be part of this object or not. They would just take this object and save it as is in the database. It's a great way to save time, but it also opens a door for mass assignment. So a way to exploit mass assignment, uh, let's see how it looks like. A legit API call to add a new user would contain just username and password. But then uh, me as an attacker, if I know, or like if I assume the developers use a mass assignment functionality on the code, I can also try to send uh, some property of the user, which is the role, and to, uh, to send it to, to admin. And what happens because the developers take this whole JSON object and save it as is in database, they don't really know that I shouldn't have access to this property. Um, and I basically would be able to create myself an admin account. Uh, an example from New Relic, uh, it was found by James Kettle from Pods Figure. Uh, he was able to create, to get himself a pro access to, to New Relic without paying. Basically, by sending a new parameter, a new property of allow API access, this property shouldn't be sent from the client. But because the developer used mass assignment, uh, James was able to create himself uh, an account with free API access. Let's jump to number eight, 
uh, injection. We basically change an in injection used to be number one for many years, but then we change it from like, we move it from like number one to number eight. Uh, and then people ask me, you know, why do you think that injection is not very relevant anymore? Or at least it's not as severe as it used to be. So I believe that the main reason why injections used to be that common is because of SQL injections. SQL injections today are not really common because of, uh, as we talked about, ORM environments. There are gazillions of security products that solve SQL injections and also the use of NoSQL. It's true that NoSQL injections uh, exist, but are not very severe, but they are usually not very severe or common. Um, let's talk about uh, number nine, improper asset management. So this is, it's not a very sexy vulnerability. It's more like a housekeeping uh, type of vulnerability. And it has two subcategories. The first one, uh, what we can see is many times companies are not aware of all the API endpoints that are exposed to the internet. Uh, so what happens, you have this API that exposes three different endpoints, get user, update location, and export all users. And what happens is that uh, the developer that wrote this uh, export all users function uh, didn't really write documentation to the endpoint. So nobody knows it's exposed to the internet. Uh, and it can be very dangerous because if you don't know about an endpoint, uh, it can easily become a security problem in the future, especially if we talk about some temporary endpoint. The, the second part of the problem is more like on the DevOps side. Uh, those are APIs and sometimes uh, even like entire environments, nobody know what is their purpose. Uh, many times when I perform pen tests for, uh, for companies, I would go and I would see this like uh, qa 3 allacmecom and I would ask the, the developers or the DevOps team, like, what is this uh, environment? What is qa 3 all And nobody can give me like a good environment, a, a, good, a good answer. Um, they would tell me, oh yeah, this is something that someone spinned up like a long time ago, he left the company and now we don't really want to, to touch it because we're afraid it's gonna like break something. So this is also very dangerous. And if you take a look at the bug bounty reports, many times attackers tend to find uh, exploits and vulnerabilities in those uh, APIs that are not documented. That like nobody actually think about them. So this is, this was number nine. Um, and now I'll move it over to a noop so we can give you a, a demo of the product. All right, thank you so much, uh, Inan. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen over here. Um, Inan, you can hear me, yes? Yes, yes. Perfect, perfect, perfect. First of all, um, I'd like to uh, extend a warm welcome uh, to everyone who's listening in on this session. Thank you so much for your time. Um, hopefully you're finding it useful. And uh, the in terms of housekeeping, just feel free to ask questions as I'm going through this um, high level, very, very high level demo. Um, I'll do my best to answer it uh, on this session itself, but at the same time, would welcome the opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you as well. Now, uh, as part of the this session, right, the next five, 10 minutes, I'm gonna be walking you through what a security analyst, more specifically a SOC analyst, would experience as they go about using this platform in sort of, uh, uh, addressing all the things that uh, Inan mentioned, right? Um, asset management, broken object level access control, authorization controls, um, privilege escalation. Those are common things that hit these APIs and how a platform like Traceable might be useful in A, monitoring, B, detecting, and C, obviously preventing these types of attacks from affecting your environment, your, your organization. Um, so um, the, uh, if, you, if you go and talk to any of our customers or prospects and just ask them uh, very candidly, what's that one sort of value prop that you get out of using a solution like uh, Traceable, the, I would expect a unanimous response to be around 
the visibility that you get out of this platform. A uh, variety of deployment models that you can go with, but ultimately the goal is to be able to address any application, whether it's on-premise or in the cloud, whether it is a monolith or a distributed microservice living and breathing on Kubernetes, or for that matter, even serverless infrastructure, should not matter. Uh, we should be able to monitor these applications completely agnostic to the underlying infrastructure. So to that point, as soon as you deploy our platform for monitoring your applications, the first thing that it would go about doing is discovering your assets. So the sort of unsexy um, uh, attack is around typically around asset management, right? Improper asset management. Let's address that first. It's a low hanging fruit, but at the same time, it's a difficult problem to solve. So here the platform goes in and discovers your applications, like I said, irrespective of where they are running. Uh, it also discovers the interactions that these applications are having with each other. So literally gives you sort of a lay of the land of your application environment, all the way from the edge through the internal microservices to any backend databases that they might be communicating with that you're seeing over here. From there, you can start contextually exploring each and every element in your application. For instance, let's say I'm interested in looking at the front end piece of this tray shop microservice, uh, tray shop application. I'm just going to go in and look at, first of all, the overall health of this microservice, right? Um, I can see who is talking to it, what it is talking out to. But more importantly, going back to the original problem statement of, hey, uh, what are the assets? What are the APIs that this application or this microservice is exposing? To answer that question without you actually having to go in and manually tinker around, without you having to chase down software developers for their swagger definition files, the first thing that the platform gives you, zero day, uh, is... Uh, a comprehensive list of all your APIs, including the access methods that are used for accessing those APIs, um, regardless of the language. So whether it's REST, whether it's gRPC, whether it's GraphQL, we don't care. We understand APIs. We are able to reverse engineer APIs to give you this live catalog. From there, you can understand and evaluate the actual definition of these API endpoints, what parameters are actually being exchanged. Regardless of the complexity of these parameters, they can be uh, multiple layers of parameters sitting in here as part of the JSON payload. Doesn't really matter. It's still able to figure that out and able to deduplicate things that may be part of the same API definition. From there, we are also looking at traffic that's going in and out of these APIs to evaluate if the users that are accessing these API endpoints, whether they are able to access it authenticated or unauthenticated, whether it's an external facing API endpoint, whether it's exposing any sensitive data, um, automatic categorization, data classification actually happens through the platform itself. Again, zero touch. So this is a common theme that you'll see sort of emerge. Uh, we want to minimize the amount of effort that you need to put in to, uh, to get value out of the platform, right? So we'll automatically discover things for you from your environment, give you visibility. And needless to say, um, this platform to begin with typically gets deployed in pre-prod environments um, for the asset discovery piece, for the risk assessment piece. Now with this visibility, you can even, we have customers prospects who are using us for compliance, compliance around data exposure, data exposure in transit, right? Uh, from there, we'll, let's say you are ready to move your applications into production and you want to actively protect your applications, your APIs, this platform can be used. That's actually one of the primary use cases where 
the platform actually starts evaluating API transactions, sequence of API calls. Here's an example of a sequence of API calls that the um, platform has tracked for a specific user. Similar to this singular trace, we the platform collects hundreds of thousands of traces to build a comprehensive baseline of normal user behavior. How we do that is using distributed tracing. It's a well-known technology that's been historically used by APM tools. We are using it um, as an industry first, first for uh, security purposes, right? So we are building a comprehensive baseline of normal behavior from these traces to identify anomalies, to identify users who might be trying to do something out of the ordinary, trying to do something malicious. And those users get bubbled up as part of this attacker view. The key point over here is that these users get identified. Let me just refresh the screen over here. I'm experiencing some network delays. So those users get identified based on their user ID rather than IP addresses or device IDs. So obviously, a user can come in from 10 different IPs. What's the point of tracking IPs? That's why if a user has already registered with your application, then why not use the user ID? And the, the platform has some patented technology that helps in identifying users as well. Once the bad actor has been identified, you have a literally a live storyboard of everything that the user has done so far in this environment. And that can include things like SQL injection, uh, your traditional attacks, right? Um, what uh, Inan referred to as the A8 injection attacks. That's something that the platform identifies just like a typical WAF would. There could be other examples of traditional attacks like uh, cross-site scripting, XXCs. Those are things that the platform detects every day of the week, maybe 10 times on Sunday, big deal. But where the platform really, really shines is in identifying those business logic exploits, right? Making a reference to uh, Inan's uh, favorite, which is BOLA, broken object level access control, a user trying to maliciously access data that belongs to another user, unauthorized, right? Those are things that you really cannot anticipate. You cannot really write rules for. You cannot detect based on patterns or signatures. You really need to have an intimate understanding of the business logic of the application. And that's what we shine in. That's what this platform shines in. Again, using the contextual power of distributor tracing married with uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence as the marketing world, world calls it, but it's really statistics, right? Uh, on a massive amount of data. So these are things that the platform detects once a user has been identified. You have the option of blocking that user, uh, preventing them from ever interacting with the platform. Um, from there, that's sort of the first level of incident response, but then you also want to evaluate what exactly the user did with this platform, right? You want to know um, whether this particular bad actor had access to any PII data, whether the, as the, the, the bad actor got access to any critical assets. All of those questions, detections lead to more questions than answers. So let's help you in answering those questions through this data lake that you see in front of you where you can execute, run, very contextualized searches against traces, not disconnected logs, but actual traces, which will give you the breadcrumbs, literally the breadcrumbs that the attacker has left behind, right? You can literally see the sequence of API calls that the attacker executed to eventually break into the application or eventually touch a critical asset, or try to access sensitive data, right? All of that is captured. So as you can see over here, a consolidated platform that can be used in pre-prod, asset discovery risk assessment, in prod for runtime protection of your applications, and then even for your day-to-day -day operations, things like compliance, things like incident response, uh, advanced threat hunting, 
all of that is facilitated through this data lake, which is, a, I would say, an industry first, uh, something that gives you uh, tracing capabilities for literally getting to answer questions that would otherwise take weeks, if not months, to figure out, right? So that was pretty much it from my side. I think I did well on time. Uh, but uh, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to um, post them on this Q&A channel. Uh, happy to answer them. Uh, otherwise, would welcome the opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. Uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, at Traceable. Thank you so much. Inan, any closing thoughts before we sign off? Um, no, I think uh, it was great. Perfect. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much, guys. Uh